the recent discovery of a complete Gnostic library in Egypt has not so much revived as accelerated the study of the most baffling and portentous episode in church history, the rise of the Gnostics. The latest survey of the whole field, an impressive corroborative work by a number of Dutch scholars, sees in the Gnostic crisis the end of the primitive church and the moment at which, quote, Christianity enters upon a new phase of its history. In this great revolution of the second century, the whole orientation of the church changed completely. What brought this about? It was the ceasing of prophetic voices, the continuing demand in the church for the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, gave rise then to an army of quacks and fakers who, though discredited in time, left their mark permanently and conspicuously on the Christian church. These were the Gnostics, so called. Paul had prophesied, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Here, the so-called original text uses the identical word for the failing of prophecies and the vanishing of knowledge, karagathesisthi, to be taken out of circulation, to be made inoperative, used both times in the future indicative. There's no sense of contingency here. The whole statement is simple and emphatic. Such prophecies as there are shall be stopped. Such tongues as there are shall be made to cease, pausontai. Such gnosis as there is, <clears throat> That's why I may mention it here, use the word gnosis, shall be taken away. These gifts were not simply to fade away, they were going to be taken away. They were already weak enough. We have these gifts now only in a limited form, Paul explains in the following verses. And then he makes a significant remark. But for the present time, there remains faith, hope, and love, these three. The colorless and now of the King James uh, is not fair to the emphatic nuni de, but at this time. And while the abideth of our English Bible em emphasizes the quality of lasting and reliable firmness, the original mene does not mean to be firm at all, but simply to stay behind. The emphatic these three that remain, three shall remain, in obvious contrast to the three that are going to be taken away. The contrast is between take away and remain there, you see. Namely, the gifts of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gnosis, the greatest gift of all. What was the gnosis? Gnosis means the act of knowing, and in some contexts it can be translated simply as knowledge, but not when Paul uses it. His frequent use of the word, it occurs 27 times in the New Testament, leaves us in no doubt as to what it conveyed to the early Christians. For them it was exactly what we would call a testimony of the gospel. But I think any price is worth paying for the supreme value of the gnosis of Christ Jesus my Lord, writes Paul to the Philippians, for which I have sacrificed everything, counting all but trash in comparison with acquiring Christ as my fortune. How often we have heard such expressions as that. I would not exchange my testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ for all the wealth of the world. God hath shined in our hearts in proportion to the illumination of the gnosis of the glory of God in the face of Christ, he writes to the Corinthians. Our spiritual weapons, he tells them, cast down every high thing raised up against the gnosis of God, abolishing logismoi, human calculations, and bringing every noima, every argument, every reasoning into conformity with obedience to Jesus Christ. Here we see that gnosis is not the normal fruit of human thought or reason or research. It confounds these logos moia noima. I am not, I am an ordinary man, says Paul, as far as logos, that is education, mental power, and so forth are concerned. But I am certainly not such with regard to the gnosis. Instead, that word gnosis is the same word as our word no, spelt with a K, you see. How can I help you, he says to the Corinthians again, if I don't speak to you in revelation or in gnosis or in prophecy or in didache, that is inspired teaching? Here the gnosis is plainly knowledge acquired only by revelation and not in ordinary ways. Paul reminds the Colossians that the gnosis is hidden away, hidden away in Christ, and that not everyone has it who claims to. This is the famous science falsely so-called of 1 Timothy 6.20 where Timothy is really told to avoid arguing with those who claim to have the gnosis but don't have it. The title of Irenaeus' one and only surviving work is The Evidence Against and Refutation of What is Falsely Called the Gnosis. The first men to write against the Gnostics are always very careful to designate their teachings as the false gnosis and themselves as the so-called or the self-styled Gnostics. 
This is very important to note because it shows that there was or had been a real gnosis which these people were imitating. They took utterly false ways, wrote Eusebius, and announced themselves as the bearers of what they falsely called the gnosis. In contrast to them, Oregon and Clement of Alexandria described themselves as true Gnostics. Since the Gnosis gave rise to more research and speculation than any other aspect of Christian doctrine, one would expect scholars to be most grateful for the genuine official definition of true Gnosis, which Eusebius has handed down to us from very early Christian times, and to make it a point of departure for all their studies. Strangely enough, they never mention it, and yet it's the key to the whole business. Eusebius thus quotes Clement. To James the Just, and to John, and to Peter, after the resurrection, the Lord conveyed the Gnosis. These handed it on to the rest of the apostles, and the rest of the apostles in turn to the seventy. End of quote. So we have a true Gnosis, a certain knowledge entrusted to the general authorities of the church after the resurrection, and as far as we know, to no one else. This was precisely the knowledge which the Gnostics so-called later claimed to have. From the titles and contents of recently found Gnostic writings, it is plain that their special boast was to possess what Christ taught to the apostles after the resurrection. Eusebius has preserved an account from, Euse uh, from uh, Hegesippus, one of the very earliest Christian writers, describing the emergence of these pretenders. It's most significant. This is the way it goes. Up until those times, says Hegesippus, the church had remained a pure and uncorrupted virgin, while any that were inclined to pervert the sound doctrine of the saving gospel were still sulking, as it were, in dark corners. But when the holy quorum, the chorus of the apostles, had ended their lives in various ways, and that generation passed away of those who had heard the divine wisdom with their own ears, at that moment the conspiracy of godless error took its rise through the deception of false teachers who, as soon as the last apostle had departed, or since there were no longer any apostles left, first came out openly and henceforward undertook to match the teachings of the truth with what they falsely styled gnosis. End of the quote. Note it well, as long as there were living apostles, these impostors had been kept in their place by apostolic authority. As long as people were still alive who had actually heard the preaching of the Lord, these deceivers could not claim to have it. <clears throat> but lurking in dark corners, they bided their time, and that time came. As soon as the apostolic generation passed away, <clears throat> the barriers of apostolic authority were removed. The deceivers had nothing to fear. Overnight the church swarmed with them, says Eusebius elsewhere. They sprang up like mushrooms, says Irenaeus. They operated with complete impunity and immunity. Where then were the successors of the apostles who should have kept them in their place and continued to wield the authority which had so long overawed them? That authority was not there. The church found itself in a serious predicament, a predicament fully set forth by Irenaeus in his great work on the Gnostics. Many, he says in his introduction, <clears throat> are bringing in false doctrines, making convincing noises, taking liberty with the logia, that is, the written sayings of the Lord, having become bad interpreters of the good and correct word. They turn many aside, persuading them that they have the gnosis from him who planned all things and ordered them, and so are able to teach higher and greater things of that God who made the heavens, the earth, and all that in them is. They argue very convincingly because of their training with words, making truth and falsehood indistinguishable. Irenaeus then describes them as working inside the church, as regular members, wolves, all but indistinguishable from the sheep, making what they say, he says, appear truer than truth itself. From this it is evident that the Gnostic teaching was not particularly strange and exotic, <clears throat> that it was so Christian as to fool the most orthodox, that it dealt with mysteries of the universe, and that it purported to come from Christ himself. Nearly all studies of Gnosticism in the past have sought the key to its origin and nature in the original sources of their various uh, doctrines and their great variety there. Thus, some scholars have maintained that Gnosticism is simply the adoption by the Church of Greek philosophy, because the Gnostics used Greek philosophy. But others say it's a typically Jewish production. Others have claimed to find its origin in Egypt, in Asia Minor, Babylon, Samaria, Persia, India. Opinions differ as widely today as ever. It is as if various parties called upon to describe the nature of a bucket <clears throat> were to submit careful chemical analysis of all substances carried in buckets. There would be a milk school, a water school, a brand school, and so forth, each defining buckets in terms of a particular content. 
the important thing about the Gnostics is not that they adopted doctrines and practices from Iran or Alexandria, but they showed a desperate eagerness to latch on to anything that looked promising, no matter where it came from. Irenaeus' survey of those practices and doctrines easily explains this urgency. The Gnostics had caused an immense sensation and had gained a huge and growing following by the electrifying announcement that they had the Gnosis, revealed knowledge, what the Lord told the apostles after the resurrection, the things he had taught to Peter, James, and John. Having made the claim, they were, so to speak, on the spot they had to deliver. They had to come through with something, something wonderful, supernatural, which at the same time would correspond in some degree to widespread rumors and traditions in the church as to what the Gnosis really was. And so they welcomed any teaching and practice that combined an air of mystery and superior knowledge with a cosmic sweep and scope. From them, now this is from Irenaeus, for them, he says, God was something beyond the grasp of ordinary Christians. They gave secret lessons and charged money for them. They built up elaborate philosophical systems based on abstract and personified concepts. They practiced ordinary magic and specialized in trick miracles, such as changing wine into blood, says Irenaeus. They tried to produce supernatural experiences by the use of drugs and stimulants. They cultivated a large vocabulary of fancy technical words to impress the public. They made a big thing of numerology. They brought forth libraries of faked apocryphal writings to cause a sensation. They parodied celestial marriage and baptism while teaching that water baptism was not necessary since spirit is everything. They said it was impossible for the body, since it is made of earth, to participate in salvation. They condemned marriage. They practiced extreme unction. They taught transmigration of souls. They venerated holy images, in particular a portrait of Christ. These are a few of the things charged against them by Irenaeus, and what a hodgepodge. But it all has one obvious purpose, to make it appear that the powers and gifts and knowledge of the ancient apostles were still on earth, for that is what they claimed to have and did not have. This much is known for sure about the Gnosis, writes Quispel, the present-day leader of Gnostic studies, that we may say with confidence that the proportion of nincompoops and crackpots was greater among them than elsewhere. And yet what a lot of stuff introduced by them was preserved by conventional Christianity, a most suspicious circumstance. The Gnostic experiment proved a number of important things. First, that the gift of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, cannot be faked. The Gnostics made a desperate and determined effort to display the powers the apostles had once enjoyed. But after the passing of the talented and enthusiastic first generation, the school of Simon Magus, who you will recall once tried to buy the power of the priesthood from Peter, they fell back on the safe conventional supports of philosophy and mysticism, which were deep and recondite enough to satisfy the church. <coughs> Eusebius has preserved from a number of sources the pathetic attempt of the Montanists to keep alive the gift of prophecy, for example, a project which was finally given up in despair after the death of the Lady Maxilla. <coughs> in the second place, the Gnostic affair of the second century showed how terribly hungry the Christian world was for spiritual gifts. They yearned for prophecies, tongues, and the marvelous Gnosis, and they never stopped yearning, even after the, Gnosis, the Gnostics had been reabsorbed into the main church. A number of recent studies have shown the tendency of Gnosticism to pop up in every century, only to be discredited when the claims put forward were found to be unsubstantiated. For the third and most significant point proven by the Gnostic experiments, experience and experiment <clears throat> was that the main church was not able to satisfy the demand for spiritual gift. Irenaeus himself can make fun of all the silly pretensions of the Gnostic, but he is every bit as pitiful and frustrated a figure as they when he tries to come forward with a positive program. The false Gnostics, in his introduction, he says he's taken it upon himself to answer them back. The false Gnosis wouldn't have stood a chance against a true one, which was conspicuously not there to set up against it. As Neander pointed out long ago, to meet the Gnosis, the Gnosis so-called, the church had to invent another Gnosis, which it then claimed to be the ancient one. But it was much too late to regain or claim ancient gifts that had once been already denied. And it is not surprising that in setting up its counter-Gnosis, the main church imitated her rival all down the line. They ended up resembling each other exactly. It is by no means a paradox, says von Harnack, concluding his famous study on the subject, when one maintains that in Catholicism, Gnosticism won half a victory. The only trouble with Gnosticism, Harnack explains, was that it was ahead of its time, and the problem of the Gnostics was solved when the rest of the church finally came around to their way of thinking. Certainly it is a remarkable thing that there never was a formal condemnation of Gnosticism. 
as in the case of other heresies, and as there certainly would have been if any apostle or the equivalent in authority had been alive. There was no council held to consider this greatest and most dangerous of all heresies, because there was no one to call one. Self-appointed defenders of orthodoxy, such as Irenaeus describes himself to be, could only oppose their doctrine with a new doctrine of their own, and the teachings of Irenaeus himself differ from those of the Gnostics, he refutes, only in the manners of terminology. Their propator is his God by another name. Their pleroma is his cosmos. What they call the logos of God, he says, is Jesus Christ, no more, no less. And so he falls in with nearly all their arguments, beliefs, and concepts, and the only real argument is about words. The rise, prosperity, and absorption of the Gnostics is one of the most significant commentaries on the loss to the church and the world of the gift of prophecy 